Um, okay, so today I will talk about fragmenting molecules in such a way so that we don't destroy the chemistry around the bond. Um, and also we want to make sure that we capture non-local through bonds effects for these torsion stands. So one second, this, okay. Um, so why do we need to fragment molecules? We want to avoid the high computational co um, cost of running quantum chemistry torsion scans. So um, most quantum chemistry methods such as hard fact, EFT scale poorly with molecular size. And what I'm showing over here, um, um, what I'm showing over here um, is the data that we have from QC archive. On the X axis, you see the heavy atoms on the Y axis, the CPU time for one yeah, for one um, gradient optimiz for, for one um, gradient evaluation. And as you can see, it scales poorly with molecular size. Now, if you overlay the distribution of small mo of FDA approved small molecules, and these molecules were taken from the drug bank, what you see is that, you know, on average, most drug-like molecules have roughly 25 heavy atoms. And from our estimate, that would mean that an average torsion scan would cost around 1 million CPU seconds. And in comparison, when you look at a molecule that has 15 heavy atoms, that costs approximately 300,000 CPU seconds, which is an order of magnitude less. So we want to fragment the molecules to reduce computational cost. But in addition to reducing computational costs, we want, also want to avoid intramolecular non local like through space intramolecular interactions that can convolute the torsion scan. We want the torsion scan to mostly include the 1-4 interactions and the conjugation level of conjugation around the bond. And we want non-local through, through space effects to be taken care of by other, by other parts, by other parameters in the force field, such as non-bonded Leonard Jones. So what are some problems that we can run into when we fragment molecules? So let's take a look at this example, the biphenyl, and we'll look at the central bond. What I'm showing on the left is the torsion scan of the central bond. And as you can see, it looks, it, it, you know, it can rotate. Now, if you protonate the nitrogen on this molecule, the barrier heights increase. If you deprotonate the oxygen, it increases some more. And when this molecule is, a Zwitter, is, is in the Zwitter ion, um, you end up with a scan that looks more like a double bond than a single bond. Now, if you take these molecules and you run molecular mechanics um, torsion scans, as I'm showing on the right, you see all these torsion scans look alike, which is not what we want. Um, so why is this happening? If you draw the resonance structure for this biphenyl, what you see is, is that the central bond is actually part of the conjugated system. And it is an aromatic bond. So why is this a problem? So how, well, we see the problem, but how is this a problem when we are trying to automate fragmentation and um, also parameterization of torsion parameters? Um, one is that most chemioinformatics tool, toolkits will label the central bond as a rotatable bond. Another problem is can we use the same torsion parameters for these four torsions? They're the same torsion type, but they very obviously have very different um, torsion scans. And what, and rele most relevant for this discussion right here is how do we ensure that we do not naively destroy the chemical environment by fragmenting a remote substituent that has a strong effect on the bond of interest that we want to run um, QC torsion scans for. So we can use um, the AM1 Vibric bond order, uh, which is a cheap measure of electron population overlap between two atoms. The way it is calculated is by taking the quadratic sum of the occupied orbitals in atom A and B in the bond. This value, the Vibrick bond order, gives us a number, and the number is very closely correlated with what 
it closely responds to what chemists think about when they think about bond multiplicity. So what I'm showing over here is the Vibrant bond orders for this series of molecules. In the neutral molecule, we end up with a bond order that's close to one, and it increases until around 1.5 for the Zwitter ion. Now, when we plot this Vibrant bond, we, we plot the energy of the barrier heights against these Vibrant bond order, what we see is that this relationship is pretty linear. So what that is telling us is you know, a few things. One is that can we use this relationship to interpolate torsion parameters for the same torsion types but in different chemical environments if the chemical environment changes by remote substituent? And um, also, can we use the vibrant bond order as a surrogate to to determine if our fragmentation, if, our, if the way we fragment in the molecule destroyed this, um, the chemistry of the central bond. So to take a look at how general this is, this linear relationship of the vibrant bond order versus the torsion barrier, uh, I generated the set of substituted phenyls where um, on the X1 position, at the X1 position, we have functional groups that span you know, electron donating and electron withdrawing groups as shown on the bottom. And at the X2 position, so we, we generated the set where we have a, a, full, you know, a full spectrum of electron donating and withdrawing groups at the X1 position. And then also at the X2 position, we created this combinatorial set. And then for each, for each substituent that's at the X1 position, we calculated the Vibrick bond order for this bond in the chemical environments of all the different, of all the, all the substituents on the X2 position. So in this case, what I'm showing is what these Vibrick bond orders, what the distribution of Vibrick bond orders look like. So on the, on the y-axis here, I don't know why my pointer is not working. Trying to point, but it's okay. You can just describe which one to look at. Okay, so the X one at the Y axis is the substituent that's at the X one on the molecules on the left. And say for NME two, we have this distribution in Burgundy, and what's in that distribution are all the molecules that have NME2 at X1, but then um, all other substituents at the X2. For the Y1 and the Y2, we also have um, nitrogen there. And what you can see from this plot is two things. Number one, there is definitely a trend as the substituents become more electron withdrawing. The overall trend is that the vibric bond order will be lower. And the second thing is that you see that for each, for each substituent itself, the vibrant bond order will change depending on what's on the X2 position. So now we, we, um, I, I, you know, I, we sam basically took uh, molecules from this set, representative molecules, and ran torsion scans on them. And what we found was, What we found was that we still have this linear relationship. So on the, again, on the x-axis, you see the Vibrick bond order on the y-axis to the torsion barrier heights of the torsion scans. And I'm showing here a few substituents. And you see that that linear relationship still holds. And then if we look at all other substituents that we had in the set, we still see that relationship. So what this is telling us is, number one, we should be able to use the Vibrick bond order as a surrogate to torsion barrier heights. Um, in such a way, maybe to interpolate vibrant bond orders when it comes to fitting torsion parameters, but also now when we're fragmenting the molecules, the relative change in the vibrant bond order will tell us if we had destroyed the, if, if, we, if we significantly change the chemistry around the central bond that we're interested in running torsion scans for. So our fragmentation scheme right, that we're using right now is we take a molecule, calculate the vibric bond orders for the, find the rotatable bonds, calculate the vibric bond order. And then for our initial fragment, we use the scheme that um, 
a group of Pfizer scientists have done, um, which is in this reference, where you, you find, you, you built out, you, you make sure that you keep all the one to five atoms around the central bond, and then you also make sure not to, dist not to fragment rings or specific functional groups that we don't want to fragment. So now when we get the, that, minimal, that minimal fragment, we then recalculate the vibrant bond order for the central bond. Now, if this bond order is within a, thresh, a, a user set threshold, then we, we, have, we say that we have arrived at a fragment that is representative of the chemistry in the parent molecule. But if the vibrant bond order has, is, you know, if, if the difference of the vibrant bond order of the, of the fragment and the parent molecule is above a threshold, then now we have to start building around the fragment. So what we do is, so here I'm showing is this fragment here has, is, is 0.9, the vibrant bond order for the highlighted bond is 0.99, while in the parent molecule is 1.09. So that's according to the data that I had previously, um, a 0.1 difference in the vibrant bond order does lead to a significant change in the torsion span. So now we start building out around this bond until we reach the vibrant bond order that's within the disruption threshold. So what, what disruption threshold should we be using? Well, for that, I generated a benchmark set so that we can you know, validate the fragmentation scheme and determine what, what the, the um, what the parameters for our scheme should be. So for that, I filtered through um, drug bank to arrive at molecules that um, are, you know, within 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 the size and the number of of rings that we basically I filtered drug bank based on size and some other um, some other properties and arrived at around 700 FDA approved molecules. Then I took those molecules and did an exhaustive fragmentation. Um, what that means generated every possible fragment from this molecule without, without fragmenting um, rings. And then for each one of those fragments, I generated a set of conformers and then calculated the vibrant bond order for those, for those calculators, so what, for those conformers. So what we ended up with were distrib distributions of vibrant bond order for every fragment that has the bond that we are, that, that, that has that specific bond that we're looking at. So in this case, we're looking at um, the parent molecule that's up on the left. And we're looking at the highlighted bond between the sulfur and the ring. And what these distributions are showing you are all fragments from that parent molecule that has this bond. And if you look at these distributions, what you find is that there's, you know, you see this somewhat clustering of fragments. And when we look closely at these fragments in these different clusters that are colored, that are, have, you know, have these different colors, you, we find that there are actually important chemical changes, remote chemical changes that causes these shifts in the vibrant bond order. Um, the colors are based on a score that we give of calculating how far this distribution is from the parent molecule. And in this case, um, I'm using the MMD, which is the maximum mean discrepancy. And then on the right, what I'm showing is what we have on the, the x-axis is this distance score, this MMD score. And then on the left, on the y-axis, we have the CPU um, time one the estimated CPU time of a gradient evaluation for this fragment. So we want to end up, we want to end up with fragments that are at the lower left corner, which are cheap. They're not too expensive, but they're also, they're also close to the chemical environment in the parent molecule. We don't want to end up with small molecules that are just too far away or, you know, large molecules either. Now, with our fragmentation scheme, we end up with a fragment that's circled in red, which is good. It's small and it is, it, it, the, parent, the, the chemical environment hasn't moved too far away from the parent chemical environment. 
Now, after looking at all these molecules that um, I had shown before is what we found, we found was that certain bonds are more sensitive than other bonds, which makes sense because the, it's the conjugated bonds that are part of conjugated systems that will be more sensitive to remote substituents. So what I'm showing over here are these you know, three just representative molecules. And the more sensitive the bond is, the, you know, the, the color, the more red the, the bond is, the more sensitive it is. But then what I'm also showing is which functional group or which chemical moiety it is sensitive to. So on the, on the left, you have that, you know, the red bond is sensitive to the protonated nitrogen and, and so on. So now that we had this benchmark set, we ended up with like a roughly around 300,000 fragments. Um, we can now benchmark the set to see um, what kind of threshold we should use. So what I'm showing over here are these, are, are, are the molecules from this benchmark set and we fragmented them using different thresholds. So on the left, I'm showing a very small threshold. So if you have a very small threshold, you do end up with very close fragments to the parent, but you're also ending up with larger fragments and the computational cost is too expensive. If you use a threshold that's too big, like a threshold of 0.1, yes, you end up with many small fragments, but you also end up with many of them that are, you know, their distance score is just too high. With a threshold of 0.03 is where you end up with uh, most fragments that are in the lower left quadrant where they're, you know, they're not too expensive and their distance score is not that high. So now when we compare the, these distance scores to just using the, the, the rule-based scheme that we have from the Pfizer group, which, um, it, you know, for those schemes, for many cases, it does find good fragments. But for the cases where you have sensitive bonds to remote substituents, what we found, if you look at this, um, at this plot, we're looking at the difference in those distance scores. And, you know, we sometimes have that the Pfizer does perform better. The, the simple scheme does perform slightly better than, the, um, than, than our scheme, but in those cases, it's only performing a little bit better. We have several that are, many that are equally good, but when, but in many cases, in showing in the blue part of the distribution, when we do better, we do, um, we do, you know, you know we, we, we do better in those molecules where we have the sensitive bonds. So now after looking through the set is what we found was which chemical groups induce these non-local effects. And what I'm showing um, at the top of the slide are the groups that we found, the functional groups that we found to be, to, to induce these, these non-local, you know, long range through bonds effects. Now, again, this is not exhaustive. This is just looking at the functional groups that were in that set to begin with. And there might be other groups that, that um, induce this long range effect. Um, so the, the figures that I'm showing at the bottom is showing what, what does it look like? So the blue, the, the molecule that has the central bond highlight in blue is the parent molecule. And the, the highlighted bond is the bond that we're looking at. And the one that is circled is the functional group that it is sensitive to. So in the orange, so the blue distribution is this distribution of vibric bond orders from calculated at the central bond um, from omega generated conformers. Now, if we look at the orange distribution, those are the ones that we get when we just find the minimal fragment without recalculating the vibric bond order, the central bond. And if, as you see, that distribution is, you know, if you look at the distance score, it's 0.54, which is, in, 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 this, in, in this context, that's a pretty large score. Now, if we look at the green one, is the, that's, the, that's the fragment that you get from recalculating the vibric bond order and then growing out. And in this case, it found that protonated nitrogen. And now, if you look at the distance score, it's a lot smaller. And what I'm showing on the, on the right is another example, but this time we're looking at uh, deprotonated oxygen. So um, to summarize what I've shown is that the vibric bond order is a good descriptor of a bond's chemical environment. Um, it is correlated with the torsion barrier height, and we can use it as an indicator 
if the remote, if removing a remote substituent will alter the chemical environment. And we also found these eight chemical groups that have these long range effects. Um, for future directions of this project is, um, is looking at interpolating towards the force constants from the vibrant bond order. And then, um, you know, currently the scheme that we're using where you calculate the vibrant bond order and then you have to recalculate it, even though it's cheaper than running torsion scans, it's still somewhat expensive. So uh, maybe we can use some machine learning models from the data set, from the, from the exhaustive fragmentation data set that we have to learn which chemical groups and which um, bonds we need to be careful about when, that should not be fragmented. And with that, um, I would like to acknowledge um, our collaborators, the Open Force Field um, Initiative. And um, specifically, I wanna, I wanna thank Chris Bailey for, um, for initiating this project and um, the, um, our, my program NSF MLC for funding. And of course the QCR archive, archive project where all the um, torsion scans that were around for this project are available. And with that, I can take questions. Any questions? Aside from um, fragmentation, are there uh, what, like, so thinking of using this for, like, using some of the same ideas for parameter interpolation, what are the are there specific like chemical series or environments you would want to look at next if you had more time? Um, beyond the substituted phenyl set? Yeah. Um, yes. So I think what we need to do is buy phenyls besides of just, so, so what the set now, what I have now are substituted phenyls. We should look at buy phenyls. We should also look at, um, you know, different kinds of conjugation, like um, of hyper conjugation. So, you know, some combinatorial sets of some, you know, smaller fragments with um, different substituents at the different positions around the central bond. So like think about the one four and one five positions and have, let's say, you know, some like, I don't know, you know, look at oxygens and nitrogens and fluorines and, you know, just general, general um, functional groups that we know are electron donating and withdrawing around those central bonds. Does that thanks. make sense? Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think it should be possible to design a set that covers a large chemical space. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got a, a quick question. Um, how confirmationally sensitive are the WBOs and how important is it sort of exactly which confirmation you used to, to compute them? So yeah, that is a very good question. I don't have slides to show um, here in this talk, but I did do uh, an extensive analysis of that. So the the bond that I should let me let me go back in this slide a second slide deck. So this one where okay. So the bonds here shown in red, the ones that are more sensitive, are also the ones that are more sensitive to confirmations. Right, um, so there not all bonds are equal, not all bonds are is the vibrant bond order equally sensitive. Um, so yeah, so these are are sensitive to confirmation. Um, I didn't mention it here because you know there wasn't enough time, but we can use something called ELF ten vibrant bond orders, which tries to tries to like integrate out the confirmation dependency by looking at, um, by, by removing molecules that have strong um, intramolecular interactions and that remove some of the fluctuations. And those, those vibrant bond orders in general, I found are pretty consistent. Um, so you, can, you don't really need to think about the confirmations because you'll get very, you'll, they're very consistent. So you'll get very, they're very reproducible and you'll get pretty much the same vibrant bond order every time you calculate it. So that is the one we're using in the fragmentation scheme. And that is, it is implemented in OpenEye. Okay, thanks.